He was born in the golden age into a family of wealth and influence, but chose the army as a career and way of life. Brilliant, inventive, and outspoken, he enlisted as a private to fight in the Spanish-American War, arrived in Cuba as a lieutenant in the Signal Corps, and emerged as the youngest captain to serve in the army at that time. He taught himself the basics of aeronautics from a book and became the leading exponent of air power to a reluctant general staff. Promoted to Brigadier General in less than 20 years, his meteoric career collapsed after he charged the military and civilian command of the nation's defense with negligence and ineptitude. He predicted the First World War with Germany, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and even an age when planes would fly at a thousand miles per hour. His foresight and outspokenness won him both a general court-martial and a special medal of honor. His name is Billy Mitchell. He was tempestuous, he was controversial, he was outspoken, he occasionally acted intemperately, but it was Billy Mitchell who gave to us the vision of modern global aerospace power that we have today. That is why Billy Mitchell is a legend of air power. William Mitchell was the grandson of a Scottish immigrant banker, Andrew Mitchell, and the son of a United States Senator, the reform-minded Democrat John Mitchell of Wisconsin. Billy Mitchell was a college junior of 18 when the Spanish-American War was declared in 1898. He heard the news, decided to enlist, and took the train back to the family home in Milwaukee to join the Wisconsin Volunteers. After completing his basic training with the Wisconsin Militia, he was shipped out to a staging area in Florida where he was called to active service with the U.S. Army and offered a commission as a second lieutenant in the Signal Corps. By the time he arrived in Cuba, most of the fighting was over, but he impressed his superiors with his industry. He taught himself the entire code system of the Army, taught himself Spanish, and even typing to improve the appearance of his reports. By 1901, he was promoted to first lieutenant and sent back to the States for a series of assignments taking him to Alaska, Virginia, Colorado, and finally back to Virginia in 1904. He was now the youngest captain in the Army, eager to learn all he could of the new emerging technologies, radio, submarines, and airplanes. He met Orville Wright in 1908, when Wright was preparing for Army tests at Fort Myer, Virginia, where Mitchell happened to be stationed. While Mitchell did not actually witness the flights, he was impressed with the potential of what he saw. Over the next 10 years, in a variety of posts, including the Army's colleges at Fort Leavenworth in Washington, he read everything he could find on aviation. In 1914, Mitchell wrote a paper for the Command College, envisioning the possibility of invasion and attack by hostile patrol vessels and aircraft. In 1915, Mitchell took flying lessons, four of them before soloing. Now 36 years old and a newly promoted major, Mitchell was made head of the Army's aviation section in Washington. He began studying other nations' air forces, making particular notes on Germany, France, and Japan for their advanced aircraft development. By 1917, Mitchell believed the United States could no longer avoid becoming involved in the war in Europe. Both sides were hopelessly stalemated in trenches on the ground. American volunteers were flying with the French army in a unit called the Lafayette Escadrille, but tactics were almost non-existent, and the death rate was appalling. 
Mitchell finagled an appointment as an observer with the French army. One week after his arrival, German U-boats sank the liner Lusitania, and the United States, completely unprepared, entered World War I. Despite promises of thousands of American-built planes, the United States had almost no pilots to fly them. Flight school consisted of 50 hours of rudimentary training, often with disastrous results. So the peacetime nation began the process of building airplanes out of cloth and wood. Designing easy to assemble aircraft which were tested then disassembled and packed in crates for the long voyage across the Atlantic. In the next six months, Mitchell was promoted to full colonel and given command of U.S. Air Forces assigned with the First Army. Mitchell believed that air power demanded special persons to be pilots, and he actively recruited those he felt demonstrated the right qualities. One of them was a young chauffeur attached to General Pershing's staff. He'd already established himself as a race driver in the States before the war, and so Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed Hat in the Ring Squadron became a flyer, an ace fighter pilot instead of a driver. But there were still no American planes to be had. Mitchell struck a deal with the French. If they would give him the planes, he would fly American pilots against the Germans. On Sunday, April 14, 1918, Mitchell gave the order to launch patrols against reported incoming German aircraft. Two American pilots took off and in less than two minutes engaged the Germans. Two minutes later, both German planes had been struck and their pilots bailed out. By July 1918, after four exhausting years of warfare, both sides were reaching levels of desperation. While the French and British controlled their sections on the ground, the Germans controlled the air. Attempts to send up observation planes only brought a swarm of a dozen German fighters eager to send them flaming to the ground. The Americans devised a counter strategy. Observation airplanes were escorted by as many as 50 American pilots. Now in the summer of the fourth year, the Germans made an all or nothing assault on the French American lines near San Miguel. 70 German divisions crashed against the Allies and buckled the front lines. Mitchell recognized the Germans would throw thousands of airplanes into the fight unless he beat them to it. He ordered 1,500 planes to be readied and actually launched 1,481. He attacked the German supply lines, cutting the troops off from behind and trapping them between Allied ground forces and his massed pursuit planes and bombers. In the four days of the offensive, American flyers made 3,300 flights over enemy lines, dropped 75 tons of explosives, and destroyed 60 German aircraft. Based on his success in smashing the German offensives and coordinating air and ground units, Mitchell was promoted to Brigadier General in October 1918. He was drawing up plans for a new combat contingent. Armed with machine guns, these special infantry units would parachute into position from bombers designed to carry a dozen or more men. The war ended before Mitchell could try his idea. It would be another year before it was tested by one of his junior officers, a young major named Hap Arnold.
With the victory of Allied forces came a prayer from the public that such a war, with such terrible losses of human life and weapons of destruction, never be allowed to happen again. Many called for the elimination of the army, the destruction of the navy. Aces like Rickenbacker were shown by the newsreels, trading in their uniforms for new suits to pursue peaceful careers. Some of the flyers took up barnstorming, demonstrating the skills they had learned in combat to thrill crowds who gathered anywhere the sound of an airplane engine could be heard. Mitchell returned to Washington and the War Department as the acknowledged expert on military aviation. But those who commanded the Army and Navy felt that aviation was still just an adjunct to artillery and battleships. The service heads joined with powerful groups in Congress to effectively wipe out the aviation units in favor of more conventional weapons. Without realizing it, they began a battle which would last longer than the war itself and cost Mitchell his career. It was Billy Mitchell who first recognized in this country that the stakes of warfare had changed, that three-dimensional forces, those operating in the atmosphere and those operating below the surface of the sea, would hold two-dimensional surface forces hostage. And he paid with his career for his outspokenness in championing that view. In the spring of 1919, Mitchell wrote an article in which he predicted, the Atlantic is going to be crossed and within short times, we shall have regular airplane mail transportation between America and Europe. We no longer measure distance by miles, but by time. The commercial traveler henceforth will read the new air timetable and find that Chicago is four hours from New York or Los Angeles is 28 hours from Boston. To prove his points, he launched the first transcontinental air reliability contest of Army aircraft from New York to San Francisco. But as deputy director of the Air Service, Mitchell focused his energies on convincing the Congress of the value of his vision, that air power would soon overrun that of the Navy's warships and Army's ground troops. His vision was made public in congressional budget hearings, where he testified and laid out his challenge. All we want to do is have you gentlemen watch us attack a battleship. Give us the warships to attack and come watch. A furious Navy secretary, Josephus Daniels, replied that he would stand bareheaded on the deck of any battleship Mitchell tried to bomb. The test began June 20th, 1921, off Hampton Roads, Virginia. One by one, over the next month, Mitchell's planes targeted and hit mothballed American and German ships. And, one by one, they sank. The final attack was against the German battlecruiser Ostfriedland on July 21st. Largest of the German dreadnoughts, she had already survived a combined torpedo attack and salvos from British battleships in World War I. The American and German navies considered her unsinkable. Mitchell's flight of bombers sighted and dropped their payloads. They placed the bombs around the ship, crippling the battleship's hull. It took less than four minutes and four bombs. Ostfriesland rolled and went down. Mitchell next led a flight of Martin bombers against the retired U.S. battleship Alabama.
With General Pershing and other Army and Navy officers looking on from the transport ship San Miguel, the air group sent the ship to the bottom. But the success of the bombing test did not spell the end of Mitchell's troubles with the Navy and War Departments. In fact, it made things worse. Despite promises from the new president, Coolidge, to create a unified military department and support for expanding the Air Corps, nothing happened. The Army and Navy kept their individual departments. In 1925, Mitchell was reverted to his permanent rank of colonel and transferred from Washington to Kelly Field as air officer. Others who had supported him, like Hap Arnold, were also reduced a grade in rank. Following a pair of air disasters in September 1925, Mitchell issued a press release which said, the accidents are the result of incompetence, the criminal negligence, and the almost treasonable administration of our national defense by the Navy and War Departments. On October 3rd, 1925, Mitchell was ordered to be court-martialed. The trial lasted weeks, and Mitchell continued to be blunt with the court and prosecutor. Prosecutor, you say that in future wars, soldiers will invade by leaping in parachutes from airplanes? Would you care to reveal who gave you this startling information? Mitchell, nobody gave it to me. It's quite obvious to anyone with the slightest foresight. Is it your actual belief that the country is vulnerable to attack from the air in the foreseeable future? Colonel Mitchell, do you have any idea of the width of the Atlantic Ocean? Approximately 3,000 miles. And the Pacific Ocean? I know what you're getting at, and I tell you that it won't be long before airplanes will fly non-stop across both oceans. You say that airships traveling 1,000 miles an hour will fight each other in the stratosphere? Do you have any comprehension how fast 1,000 miles an hour is? Of course I do. Do you know it is faster than the speed of sound? Approximately 250 miles faster than the speed of sound. You say that the Hawaiian Islands, our base at Pearl Harbor, will fall victim to an air attack? Does your crystal ball reveal by what enemy this mythical attack will be made? By whom, Colonel? By whom? The attack will be made by the Japanese. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, launching their planes from aircraft carriers just as Mitchell had predicted. The court found Mitchell guilty of insubordination and suspended him from rank, pay, command, and duty for five years. Billy Mitchell resigned from the Army and retired to his farm in Virginia. Now a civilian, he continued his campaign for a separate Air Force Department and unified command under a Department of Defense. He met with old friends and supporters and spoke and wrote constantly to the public. But in 1936, the wear of the years and campaigning finally took Billy Mitchell. He died February 19th in a hospital in New York. <laughs> Billy Mitchell fought with distinction in two wars. He set a world speed record and proved beyond question that his vision of the future for the nation and his beloved air service were correct. Though a thorn in the side of those he considered mossbacks for failing to be innovative or intelligent, his voice and vision reflected his love of country. What Mitchell did was he lit a fire that burned within the hearts of air power advocates after him. People like Hap Arnold, Tui Spots, 
and their successes. And his example, uh, I think, should be with us to the present day. He is a revered figure and should be as long as the Air Force continues to exist. On July 18, 1947, two months before his dream for the United States Air Force was finally made a reality, a special act was passed by Congress promoting Billy Mitchell to the rank of Major General, retroactive to the date of his death. It was finally recognition of the contributions to his country by this legend of air power. America's first aerial assault against Japan was led by Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, flying the B-25 bomber named after Billy Mitchell. He was born in Alameda, California, just before the dawning of the 20th century. His mother raised him while his father left them to chase dreams of gold in Alaska. Within three years, they would be rejoined in the frontier town of Nome, where he was forced to write that he was the shortest student in the town's one-room school. But if he never grew very tall, he would rise over the years to the stature of national hero. He would achieve world recognition as the holder of speed records and earn the Medal of Honor. His contributions to aviation revolutionized the industry. His name was Jimmy Doolittle, and he is a legend of air power. Doolittle had missed the fighting war in Europe. Now he and the fledgling Air Corps faced a greater challenge how to convince senior officers and the public that the airplane was not only a weapon needing further development, but deserving of its own branch of the service. While General Billy Mitchell was flying demonstration flights, bombing captured German battleships to exploit the aircraft's destructive capability, Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle was on the West Coast, mastering his flying lessons and developing some techniques of his own. He convinced his immediate superiors that the proof the public needed lay in demonstrating that the airplane was reliable and safe. If he could use the airplane to set records, it would bring glory and good public attention to the Army. He was given the green light. After several failed attempts, on September 4th, 1922, he made the first coast-to-coast -coast flight in less than 24 hours. With the feet came headlines and the greater willingness to let him do more which fit Jimmy's plans perfectly. His public image was one of a daredevil, but he was a, he was a master of the calculated risk in that he never took a risk without calculating the chances of surviving that risk. In October 1925, Doolittle won the Schneider Cup race in a Curtis seaplane with an average speed of 232 and a half miles per hour. In the following four years, he won the McKay and Bendix trophies, and in 1929, completed his test of the first instrument-only flight. The greatest contribution that I made to aviation was when the Guggenheim Fund established a blind flying laboratory, of which I was the head. And uh, we developed the artificial horizon, the directional gyroscope, and uh, various uh, things that made it possible to fly regardless of weather and uh, ended up with making a trip around the field uh, under the hood, never having seen out of the airplane. In September 1932, he set another world speed record, this time in the Granville Brothers GB, at an average speed of 296 miles per hour. It was his last race. Doolittle's gift was anticipation. And just as he had seen the need in the industry for greater durability and safety, he now realized that the age of experimentation, seat of the pants flying, was over. From here on, he would need more expertise. He was admitted to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he earned both his master's and doctorate in aeronautical engineering. 
It was also clear to him that greater speed demanded more than just a bigger engine. He left the service to join the Shell Oil Corporation in New York. He served as spokesman for the company, but also began his own campaign for Shell to begin refining higher octane fuel. He visited Europe and took careful note of airplane development there, particularly in Germany, and was alarmed at what he saw. In his opinion, Germany was clearly rebuilding an offensive air capability. A new war was coming. He brought those concerns back to his old friends in the Army, and then made a new pitch. Jimmy Doolittle knew the Air Corps wasn't ready to fight a war. They would need new aircraft. They would need new ideas. They would need experienced leaders. He asked for and got recalled to active service, now as a lieutenant colonel. He set about looking at the plans and tactics. Then, on December 7th, 1941, Japanese naval aircraft attacked the American bases at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Now America joined the World War. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Pearl Harbor was just the beginning. The Japanese attacked at Guam, Manila, Wake Island, and the Solomons. The Japanese Navy effectively created a wide defensive ring around the home islands. Emperor Hirohito announced Japan would never be attacked successfully by her enemies. Few in the U.S. would have argued with him. With the loss of our battleships and thousands of troops at Bataan and outposts at Wake Island, attacking Japan looked to be impossible for the foreseeable future. Doolittle was selected to devise a plan to carry the war to Japan. His solution was to select 18 Army Air Corps bomber crews and train them in B-25 bombers to do the impossible. Operating in complete secrecy, they trained at Eglin, Florida, learning how to force a fully loaded B-25 airborne in less than 400 feet. In March, the crews flew their bombers cross-country to San Francisco where they were loaded aboard the aircraft carrier USS Hornet and lashed to its wooden deck. Even then, the crews didn't know where they were going or their specific mission. If they were lucky and the Japanese didn't discover them first, they would strike the first offensive blow against the Empire of Japan. At a point roughly 400 miles from Japan, they would launch their planes off the carrier. For Jimmy Doolittle, there could be just one destination, Tokyo. April 18, 1942. Doolittle's Raiders have enough fuel aboard for an 850-mile round trip. The plan calls for the planes and crews to make their bomb runs, scatter, and then return to a rendezvous point where they can ditch their planes close to the task force and be recovered. But a lookout plane spots a Japanese fishing boat. Has it seen the Hornet and transmitted their position? The order is given to destroy the boat. Doolittle knows their best advantage is surprise, and it's possible they struck quickly enough. But he cannot risk the mission on that guess. Despite being over 800 miles from the target, the extreme range of these planes, he gives the order. There will be no pickup by the Navy now. Now they must make their runs and then push on for China, hoping to land their planes safely hope to find sympathetic Chinese forces rather than Japanese troops along the coastline. Hope to survive until they can regroup and get back. One by one, the B-25 Mitchells run up their engines, wobble forward, and lurch into the air. Doolittle knows the odds. And like so many other times in his career, he knows there are no alternatives. They have a mission. They have their orders. They go. In 
The Japanese are so confident in their security, there is no fighter cover. Thus, the bombers were virtually unopposed as they flew on the deck. They swept in over the coast on their way to Tokyo. Elements separated and some climbed to 1,500 feet with a bombing. At 12.15, the attack was opened by Doolittle, who dove in before he unloaded his incendiaries upon the Japanese capital. Shipyard, docks, railroad yards, steel plant, gunpowder factory. Surprise is complete. The shock is devastating to the Japanese. Tokyo has been bombed. The lift to American morale is without measure. Doolittle has done it again. One purpose was to give the folks at home the first good news that we had had in World War II. Doolittle himself is not pleased. Downed in China, his crews are missing. Two broke orders and landed in the Soviet Union in Vladivostok. They're taken prisoner and remain in Soviet hands for over a year. Many crash land and are injured. One has a leg amputated. All of the aircraft are lost. On this, his first mission as a combat commander, Doolittle is sure the mission has been a disaster. He felt he was a failure. It caused them to um uh, bring back their fighter units to defend the Japanese islands and change their strategy in the Pacific. And changing their strategy uh, led them to believe that they should capture Midway Island. And in that great battle, they lost. So that was, could be said that the Tokyo raid by Jimmy Doolittle and his raiders was the beginning of the end. President Roosevelt awards him the Medal of Honor and promotes him to Brigadier General. Doolittle is astonished. Accepting the medal in the name of his crews, he says to the president, I will spend the rest of my life trying to earn this medal. Jimmy found himself with a new assignment, 12th Air Force Commander and later the 15th Air Force Commander. His job, take on the Luftwaffe in the skies over North Africa. A British lad came by with the new Spitfire that was just out, a beautiful airplane. And I was looking it over, and he said, would you like to fly it? I said, well, yes, I would indeed. And so uh, I got into this Spitfire and flew around for a while. Suddenly noticed two uh, battleships that were lobbing shells at each other. So I went over to watch that. And while just as soon as I got there, why, they both started shooting me. So I got out of there. It was a very interesting experience. When I got back, the Officer of the day said, uh, General Eisenhower wants to see you right away. And so uh, I rushed in there, and uh, he was boiling. He said, I've been trying to get you. Where have you been? I said, well, I was out trying out one of the new Spitfires. And he said, listen, I've got news for you. You can either try out new Spitfires and be a second lieutenant, or you can be a brigadier general and be my airman. Well, that was the first I knew that I was up for, prom for oh, promotion. Oh, oh. So uh, I said, well, it's a very easy decision, sir. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> and spent the next year, and I must say that a year from then, when he went up to take over the big command, he took me with him. I consider it the best job of salesmanship I've ever done. Jimmy Doolittle succeeded in defeating the Germans and controlling the sky. We had 12th Air Force bomber boys who had started in the muddy fields of Algeria. They were teamed up with 9th Air Force men who had eaten sand all the way from Egypt, 1,500 miles. Before 9 o'clock, we had planned to fly more than 1,000 sorties. Anything that could take off went up to the corridor. Our fighter bomber boys, including the 57th group of Cape Bone fame, were about to sweep a road to Tunis. We were using the experience gained in Egypt, smashing Rommel at El Alamein. Then we were only a few. Now we were hundreds, all grouped in a powerful package. The Germans, realizing their desperate situation, 
retreated to make a last ditch stand. From North Africa, Doolittle was promoted to Lieutenant General and moved on to England as commander of the 8th Air Force. From there, he directed U.S. strategic bombing of Germany. The Luftwaffe Fighter Command played havoc with the slower bombers. American escort fighters, already stretched to the limits of their range, could help to fend off attacks, but defense proved inadequate. Doolittle proposed a radical solution. Take the battle to the Luftwaffe. weeks, the indomitable Luftwaffe no longer controlled the skies over Germany. At war's end, Doolittle has brought about massive changes to the weapons and tactics of aviation. He has served with distinction in history's greatest war, and won nearly every decoration and award in the civilian and military world. Shell offers him his old job back as vice president of research. He agrees, but also has other things on his mind. Jimmy Doolittle's post-World War II career is not as well known as his career before the war or during, during the war, but in point of fact, Doolittle's post-World War II career is really quite remarkable in its own right. He was one of the major figures behind the creation, working behind the scenes for the creation of the United States Air Force. And he was one of the major figures behind the creation of the Air Force Association. The Air Force Association was formed to press for a separate military branch for the air power he has done so much to build. He is elected as its first president. And Doolittle, with his chief officers, meets with President Truman to press their recommendations. On September 18th, 1947, President Truman signs the National Security Act, creating the Department of the Air Force. We had a fervent belief that, just as General Arnold had said, it is important for the United States to maintain its uh, air power because the world is, is never going to be completely stable. And he said, I want to inform the American public of how important it is to occupy the high ground, to get there first with the most, uh, and to know where the enemy is before he knows where you are. Doolittle is also recognized for his vision and becomes an advisor to President Dwight Eisenhower. He serves first as a member of Eisenhower's Technical Advisory Committee, recommending development of such extraordinary aircraft as the SR-71 Blackbird. Finally, he is named chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, where he serves until it becomes NASA in 1958. I think that he would say, uh, in a completely self-effacing way, that, uh, that uh, he had just done what, what he considered to be uh, his duty. General Doolittle was a master of brevity, as an example. In the early days, as the president, and we didn't have computers, we were lucky to have three by five cards. And obviously members weren't getting their magazine or this or that, and then write in complaining. Doola would often answer me, he'd just say, dear so-and-so, I agree. So, sincerely, Doola. He was great at that. Now in his 60s, Jimmy Doolittle turns over the reins of power to younger men. But he was still active, participating in AFA meetings, making speeches, and visiting air shows. AFA dinner held at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, President Ronald Reagan paid this tribute to Jimmy Doolittle. Will you join me in a toast to a magnificent American, a man whose name will be remembered as long as the virtues of valor and patriotism last. 
Jimmy Doolittle. And in June 1985, President Reagan awarded Doolittle his fourth star. Jimmy Doolittle died on September 27, 1993, and was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Our leader has fallen. He led us in war and in peace, and he led us by example. He was an uncommon man whose foresight, integrity, and courage and intelligence were unmatched in the annals of aviation. Two years later, the Air Force Association dedicated this statue of him in the lobby of the association's headquarters. The statue of General James H. Doolittle commemorates a lifetime of achievements. It has been written that General Doolittle led one of the most useful lives in American history. I'm sure all of here would certainly agree. His achievements range from the practical to the theoretical. The general once explained his philosophy of life by saying, I believe we were put here on earth for a purpose, to make it, within our capabilities, a better place in which to live. The world is a better place thanks to this unique individual. I am sure I speak for all of us here today, and when I say how proud the Air Force Association is to have a constant reminder in the likeness of this man of wisdom, of humor, and of warm humanity. This legend in his time and ours. Doolittle literally had a hand in aeronautics all the way from the very earliest days of the open cockpit biplane, indeed the open framework biplane, all the way up to the first efforts to put man into space. You look at him, uh, this short little guy, uh, and he was truly a giant. And a legend of air power. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.